face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Policy Dialogue Series with alumni, staff, faculty, and students from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. The views expressed do not represent official positions of the school or alumni network. Our goal is to discuss specific policy solutions that can address and solve the current local, national, and international challenges we face. We are recording this on May 7th, 2021, and my name is Evan Papp, and I graduated with the class of 2011 with a focus on international security and economic policy. And I'm the executive producer for Empathy Media Lab, which produces content on labor, political economy, art, and culture. I'm very excited to be speaking with Robert C. Orr, who serves as Dean of the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General on Climate Change. Dean Orr joined the United Nations from Harvard University, where he served as the Executive Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School of Government. Prior to this, he served as Director of the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. He's also served as a United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Director of Global Affairs at the National Security Council, where he, he was responsible for peacekeeping and humanitarian affairs. Dean Orr, thank you so much for your time. It's great to be with you, Evan. Thank you. So with uh, the first question I've been asking uh, other folks at the University of Maryland, could you talk about your background and how you first got interested in public policy and why people should care about policy? Great. Uh, I love asking that question of all the people that uh, come to our school, so it's only fair that I should have to answer it as well. Um, I grew up in Southern California, and in the 1980s, Southern California was uh, receiving a huge inflow of uh, both uh, migrants, immigrants, and refugees, especially from the wars in Central America. And while I was an undergraduate at UCLA, I founded an organization to try to provide uh, medical, legal, and social services for this influx of refugees in the Los Angeles area in particular. It was very gratifying work. It was very hard work. But I very quickly uh, found that I was deeply frustrated by trying to put Band-Aids on gaping wounds um, and all the people that had not only suffered from the wars, but then from getting to the United States and then having to live uh, an underground existence in the US. So I started to think about moving up the policy stream. So to try to um, stop problems before they happen and, and help people before they're in a situation uh, in extremis. So it was really that very, human connection to people that were suffering and trying to move upstream to stop the problems before they happen. So you began with a very international perspective and you have a great deal of international experience at the United Nations. And also you have some time, I guess, with USAID in Nairobi, Kenya. What were you doing there? I, I have a little bit of a background in USAID as well. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I do have an international background, but that's not uh, how I grew up. I, I grew up um, uh, traveling outside the US very little until I got to college. And it was the opportunities in college to go and live abroad that really just opened the world up to me. Uh, I studied abroad for a year in Lima, Peru, when uh, there was a a uh, very, very difficult situation, economic collapse, as well as a, a multi-front guerrilla war. Um, and it, it really uh, educated me about the, the realities of the way people are living in the world. Um, after graduating from college, uh, I went to uh, Asia and studied Chinese and lived in China and worked in China. And that gave me a, a really good perspective on what the 21st century was going to look like in the near future. Um, so enter my, my time in Africa that you mentioned. Uh, as a grad student, 
uh, I wanted to spend a year between the years of my master's program uh, to work in Africa and work on development. So I, I got a position with the US Agency for International Development, um, providing advice to nonprofits in Kenya, providing all kinds of social, um, uh, economic and, and uh, environmental services. It was an intense year. Um, uh, the political situation was difficult. The United States was having difficult relations with the government in Kenya. And one day the director of USAID called me into his office and I was the most junior per person in the building. And he said, okay, or um, you're running this portfolio of uh, NGOs. How much money could you use? And I, I kind of cocked my head and said, well, you know, pipeline problems. I don't want to flood the NGOs with too much money. We could break them. And he said, no, no, but I mean, how much money could you effectively use to promote development? And it turned out that it was because uh, political relations and concerns about corruption with the Kenyan government had gotten to a point where the US government was looking at how to move through civil society and build that side of the equation up. And it was an incredible experience uh, working on at the, at the grassroots, but in the context of this intergovernmental kind of breakdown. Very interesting. And from grad school, I also saw that you were in the National Security Council. And for people who don't know about that, the White House has the Office of Management Budget and the National Security Council focuses on policy. And those are two of some of the, the brain links of, of the White House. And what was your experience in international peace building and uh, conflict resolution? Uh, well, when I was a graduate student um, and I started thinking about what I wanted to do afterwards, um, I, I took a flyer and applied to uh, the White House Fellowship and um, was told, you know, don't hold your breath. This, this is probably not going to work out. Well, it, it turned out that it did work out. And so after uh, writing in my uh, master's and PhD program about all the things the US government was doing wrong and needed to do differently, all of a sudden I was sitting in the White House uh, charged with implementing policies on exactly the areas I had been critical of. So it was a uh, both a, a heady experience, but also a little bit of humble pie that it's easier to armchair uh, quarterback and, and say what should be done. And then when you get your hands into the, the game and roll up your sleeves, uh, it looks a little different. And, and I tried to take that outsider's view, um, but I, I will say that um, being in charge of the peacekeeping and humanitarian uh, portfolio at the White House, uh, was uh, also uh, just exciting and gave me the sense of what government and government service can do um, uh, to really make a difference in, in many, many people's lives. And the issue of scale, uh, you can really only get to um, through government action. And so that gave me a, a, a real appreciation of not just the NGOs and um, uh, other organizations I had worked for, but the role of government itself. And working on a presidential initiative for a period of time myself, I worked closely with OMB and NSC and the amount of work that goes in with this personnel and they're often uh, career and they're doing rotations from other agencies as well. And uh, it's, it's the cream of the crop of uh, government bureaucrats. And my hat goes off to everyone who, who it's dedicates their entire time when they're there, because they, it's sometimes you know, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. and, and uh, no, nonstop. So. You couldn't be more right, Evan. And, and what I like to tell our students when I'm talking to them about career prospects is that it, it's really hard work but it couldn't be more valuable, both valuable to uh, the public good, but also valuable to develop your own skills and uh, your own ability to um, uh, craft a career and, and do what you want to do. 
Um, uh, the National Security Advisor, um, when I was serving at the NSC, um, talked with us about uh, how hard it was and how hard it was going to continue to be to work there. And he said, if you don't walk out of this building every night, because no one ever left before it was <laughs> probably 10 or 12 uh, in, the, in the night, he said, if you don't look back at this building and appreciate the opportunity to work here, then it's time to move on. And I, that really st stuck with me because it was hard work. It really was 24-7, uh, but it was an opportunity to make a difference. And I, I really encourage our students to do that public service and uh, see what mark they can make um, from that kind of a chair. So switching to another uh, organization, and I think one of the most important organizations in the world is the United Nations. And you've been uh, specifically, you've been in service under with the United Nations Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on Climate Change. Could you talk about this position and maybe just kind of open up the, the hood and, and uh, share the experience of, of working in this this very vast sprawling organization but one of the most important ones in keeping peace and and building coalitions and harmonies of interest well thank you for the the little advertisement for the un um the un like the u.s government was someplace i never really expected to work when i was going through school and training to do policy work i always saw myself in um, more advocacy and analytical jobs, uh, but like the US government, when the opportunity came to serve at the UN, uh, it just opened a whole nother world to me. Um, uh, I went uh, at Kofi, Annan, uh, Kofi Annan's request. In the last three years of his secretary generalship, he said, I built a strategic planning office uh, when I came in seven years ago, but before I leave, I want it to really work. And you've done strategic planning for the US government and in academia. I want you to come build it up at the UN. So I, I had the privilege of going in and uh, really creating the Office uh, of Strategic Planning and uh, Policy Coordination at the UN. Uh, built up a cabinet style um, uh, governmental system for the UN, which did not have that tradition at all, but then also got to tee up issues and identify the biggest issues in the world that we weren't addressing. Um, so that uh, instead of just being reactive when the problems came our way and got put into the Security Council of the UN, um, identifying issues like climate change, like women's and children's health, that uh, the international system just wasn't keeping up with. And uh, I loved that job because I got to identify problems and then provide uh, potential solutions and then have to mobilize the governments uh, of the world and the, the non-governmental actors. And, and this is really what I specialized in, if I could put it that way, in my time at the UN is not only making multilateralism among governments work, but building up multi-stakeholderism of bringing everyone to the table and everyone to the solution. So I've worked with a lot of uh, private uh, enterprises, with uh, investors, with uh, nonprofits and advocacy, and even with academic institutions uh, to craft solutions. So uh, it, was, it was just a great uh, opportunity. Uh, ultimately, I've been able to serve three secretaries general and even as Dean at Maryland, I'm, I'm still the uh, undersecretary general and senior advisor to the, the secretary general on climate change, which is a, a rather large uh, problem that uh, we're still struggling with. And obviously there was a bit of uh, a step back from the government, the previous administration. And I, I believe, have, are we still in arrears for uh, our payments to the United Nations? Well, when, when I was uh, both in the US government uh, at the White House and then later at the State Department as uh, Ambassador Richard Holbrook's deputy, um, we, 
paid back uh, a billion dollar deficit to the UN in exchange for some significant reforms. Uh, the two people that uh, I negotiated that deal with were two senators, one named uh, Jesse Helms, very conservative Republican from North Carolina, and a certain senator from Delaware named Joe Biden. And what became the Helms-Biden um, uh, bill and later law uh, that paid back that billion dollars was crafted in a fundamentally bipartisan fashion in the US system and then had to be marketed to all the governments of the world at that time, 189. And we had to get agreement from all the governments on this uh, re arrears for reform deal. Um, we have built back up um, some debts um, during uh, the Trump administration. Um, a lot of the um, dues that the US owes to the international system weren't paid. Uh, the US, of course, pulled out of uh, various organizations, including the World Health Organization. Um, I think that is coming back um, into uh, alignment with the, the Biden administration has worked to uh, start to pay back uh, those arrears. But what I really hope for here is the same bipartisan cooperation that we saw in a previous era, um, that we need that again. The world needs to see that it isn't just one party in the United States that supports international engagement and that we're not going to ricochet back and forth between um, disengagement and uh, support or engagement. Uh, there has to be an American um, policy framework that people can count on, not just for months and years ahead, but for decades. and. I think it's important that we build that uh, continuity and that sense of uh, common purpose uh, as Americans. Uh, we kind of owe that to the world and it certainly is in our interests. Uh, we aren't going to be able to promote our interests globally if we, we don't work together. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And I know we're running short on time, but I do want to talk about a testimony you gave before the House Oversight and Reform Subcommittee on the Environment last fall. Could you talk about what your recommendations were and, and what the topic was for this committee? Sure. Um, I, I testified uh, last fall before the House and the year before before the Senate largely about the same set of issues, and that is um, how do we address climate change and how does the U.S. become uh, more competitive uh, in the process of addressing climate change? I think there's great interest uh, on both sides of the aisle um, to be competitive in the 21st century economy. And I think um, the U.S. government has been struggling to find the policies that can make us economically competitive and prosperous and affect this massive transition that the climate challenge uh, poses. Um, what I, I told both the members of the House and the members of the Senate was that the United States, uh, when it leads uh, on, in the policy framework, uh, the world does follow and that we need to lead on this um, uh, challenge. The economic transition is massive. Um, our economy, like everyone's economy around the world, not only is changing, but has to change even faster to uh, take the carbon pollution out of the uh, equation while simultaneously growing the economy and growing jobs that will be there in five or 10 years. This is a massive undertaking. Um, it is something that we can do. We've seen happening. Um, even after the Trump administration pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement that, uh, that, that I helped to, to uh, give birth to, um, the U.S. kept moving on the path of climate remediation, but not through national government policy. It was through states, governors, um, mayors, business people um, banding together. And at the School of Public Policy, uh, we did amazing work through our Center for Global Sustainability to provide the analytical basis for bottom-up climate solutions. 
Um, and I'm very proud to say, Evan, that uh, when President Biden announced the U.S. goals uh, just on Earth Day uh, a couple of weeks ago of cutting U.S. carbon emissions by 50 to 52 percent um, by 2030, uh, those, uh, those goals were made in Maryland. Uh, we did the analytical work that showed it was possible to reach those goals. And I'm very proud of our school and the work that our team has done to contribute to this uh, global uh, solution. And just one follow-up question. I've been following nuclear diplomacy uh, quite a bit. And the idea that nuclear is a huge source of energy, it's zero carbon. And if you can have a deal with another country, you can lock in 50 year, 100 year supply chain um, collaboration. And energy is obviously the foundation for all economics in any economy. And China and Russia are in some ways lapping the United States because of our pullback from this uh, sector that we once led. So I, I'm just curious about what, what your views are on, on the role of, of nuclear power playing in the future of clean energy. Well, Evan, I think it's unfortunate that both in our, our politics, our partisan politics, but also in our environmental discussions in the US, um, we've gotten very black and white about the solutions and those who are for nuclear and against nuclear, we have to recognize that with the existential climate threat, uh, we need energy solutions that are um, uh, both forward looking and safe. And I think here um, uh, it's a mistake to dismiss nuclear power uh, because of the safety and security risks. Those are um, addressable. Um, not to mention that the technology has changed and that there are options in nuclear power that we did not have 10 or 20 years ago. So I think it has to be a part of our energy discussion. Um, we will need uh, energy for our base load, no matter how many renewables we build out. Uh, we need massive incentives to build out the, uh, the renewable infrastructure and the grids of the world. Uh, but I do think that nuclear is going to be a part of the solution for baseload. And I would rather have us leading in that area than ceding that to other parts of the world that may not approach the issues of safety and security of nuclear in the same way we do. Thank you for that. And we're almost out of time and I just a couple more questions. So I see the, the photo in, uh, behind you. What are you currently working on at the School of Public Policy? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show it. Uh, one thing I'm working on is that building behind me. Um, I've, I've been flying this flag for the last year to will our new home into existence. Um, it is uh, now a proud steel structure reaching to the sky. And uh, by June, 2022, we'll be moving into this uh, building. It's a, important for the School of Public Policy, not just that we will be able to accommodate the, the major growth we've been going through in the last uh, few years, but also uh, to bring our whole family together. We currently have people in five different buildings on campus. Um, this will give us a home where we can bring the family together. Um, and by that, I don't just mean our current family, I mean all of our alums. And I think this, this podcast is a recognition of we have a family that is not just a horizontal family in time, but a vertical family uh, that reaches back. And I'm looking forward to, welcoming our alums back to the school. And you see the little roof deck uh, up there on the school. Um, I want to raise a glass to all you alums uh, that were at the school, maybe even before we were in Van Munching Hall some. Uh, uh, but when we have our new home here, uh, I want to welcome everyone back. We've also been working on a lot of our hard internal work around addressing issues of systemic racism and the racial reckoning our country is going through. We've been putting in intensive work um, on nine anti-racist actions at the school. Faculty, staff, students have been leading the way and we've had major uh, additions and revisions to our curriculum. We have um, been hiring a much more diverse um, faculty and staff base. 
And we are positioning ourselves to be not only one of the most uh, diverse um, policy schools, but one that is able to apply it directly into the policy sphere, both in Annapolis uh, and in Washington, DC, as well as around the world. So a lot of big things happening. Um, I, I am just proud of what our um, faculty, staff, and students are doing. We have weathered the pandemic uh, rather well for the most part. The challenges to our students and faculty and staff have been immense, but I was so gratified to read the student evaluations from the fall of our courses. We had the highest numerical scores for our courses and our teachers in the history of the school this past semester when we were forced to go totally virtual. That doesn't mean it's been easy and it doesn't mean going virtual is the, the way to go. What it means is our, our faculty really invested themselves and our students really worked hard and we've been able to deliver a, a good outcome. That said, what we're doing now is preparing to bring everyone back to campus in the fall. So we've been working on going virtual and now we're working on coming back and uh, being in person, but also bringing some of the lessons learned from this virtual period uh, and hoping that we can capture some of the benefits of, of that pedagogy that we've learned in the last year. So there's a lot going on, it's exciting times and uh, I just could not be more proud of our school right now. Yeah, my hat's off to every everyone, faculty, students, staff for getting through it and very excited for things to come. And uh, in closing, looking into the future of 2021 and beyond, where do you see opportunity and hope? Hmm. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with hope, uh, and it's directly linked to opportunity. Um, I, I see hope in our uh, students and our alums. The reason I came back to education after a, a fairly lengthy career as a practitioner was because I believe the solutions for our 21st century problems are going to come not from my generation, but from succeeding generations. And so the academic enterprise and the educational enterprise is where my heart and head is right now. Um, and it does give me hope. Uh, you know, I, I see our um, incredible alums going out into the world. Uh, uh, one of our alums was just named Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, and then uh, another alum that just graduated last year during the pandemic um, has gone for a, an incredible uh, job at the National Housing Trust and uh, is now running for office in Prince George's County. So from uh, alums years out doing very heady stuff to alums just out, uh, we see SPP alums, our policy Terps are making a difference in, in the world on all the big issues of the day right now. So that's both where the opportunities are, but also where uh, the, the hope is. Um, I just want to keep turning out these amazing students and just enjoying watching them solve the problems of, of the day and uh, making a difference in people's lives. That's why I went into this field and I think it's why virtually all of our policy terps came here. So watching them do it uh, gives me great personal satisfaction. Dean Orr, thank you for your leadership and for your service. Thank you so much, Evan, and uh, thank you for, for this uh, podcast. It's, uh, it's a great, great uh, contribution by our alums. Thank you.